So problem sheet three, question three, was another question about this two-state Markov chain that we were talking about in terms of a broken printer. And it turns out that problem sheet three, question three, is actually quite important in that it previews some things that we're going to do later on in the course. So I thought I'd make a video explaining the answers to problem sheet question three so that everyone's up to date and thus some things that come later in the course won't be a surprise once you've seen the answer to problem sheet question three. So let's do that now. Okay, so here's the question. We've got this two-state broken printer Markov chain and we're writing mu n to be the probability that we're in state zero at time n. So obviously the probability we're in state one is one minus mu n because we have to be in one of the two states. And it says in part a, by writing mu n plus one in terms, in terms of mu n, show that whatever it is. Okay, so we want to know mu n plus 1, which is the probability that xn plus 1 equals 0. So what are we going to do here? The only tool we have at our disposal here, really, is to condition on where we were at time xn. I guess this is conditioning on the previous step, which is our normal technique for this course, in reverse. So we're going to condition on what happens at time mu n. So either at time mu n, we were at 0 also in which case we then had to stay there to be at zero time n plus one. Or alternatively, maybe we were in state one at time n, in which case we have to move over from state one over to state zero. So that's a typical conditioning argument there. But most of these terms we can write in terms of things we're told in the question. So probability xn plus 1 equals 0, that's mu n plus 1, which was what we were after. Probability xn equals 0, well, that's mu n, right? That was given in the question up there. Here we've got a transition probability from 0 to 0. Transition probability from 0 to 0 is that one up there, 1 minus alpha. Probability xn equals 1, like we said a moment ago, we're at 1 if we're not at 0, so that must be 1 minus mu n. And we have another transition probability. This is the transition probability from 1 to 0, which is that one down there, which is a beta. Uh, let's rearrange this to put all our mu n's on the same side of the equation. So we've got a mu n plus 1. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of mu n's on this right-hand side, haven't we? We've got a 1 minus alpha and a minus beta. So that's 1 minus alpha plus beta, if you like. It's lots of uh, mu n. Uh, that's on the right-hand side, so if we want to bring it over to the left, we'll have to put in a minus sign there. And what have we got left on the right-hand side? We've got this 1 beta, haven't we? So that gives us that expression. Is that what the question was after? Mu n plus 1 minus 1 minus alpha beta mu n equals beta? Yes, it is. We've got the right thing as we were asked to prove, which is excellent news. So now we can move on to part B. Part B says, by solving this linear difference equation using the initial condition mu naught equals lambda naught, or otherwise, but we're not going to do otherwise, show that some solution for mu n. So it's basically asking us to solve a linear difference equation here. So we've done these a lot, so this should be easy enough. As always, start out with the characteristic equation. Note that most of the linear difference equations we've done in this course have had three terms in mu to give us a quadratic characteristic equation. But this one only has two terms in mu. It has a mu n plus 1 and a mu n. So we're just going to get a linear equation. Much simpler. It's just going to be lambda minus 1 minus alpha plus beta lambda. And remember the characteristic uh, Lots of 1 there, sorry. And remember that characteristic equations always have 0 on the left-hand side. So because this is linear rather than quadratic, we're only getting a single root, whereas before we were usually getting two roots as a single root, uh, which is lambda equals 1 minus alpha plus beta. That's easy enough. So continuing the process as we know it and love it, the general solution the homogeneous equation uh, 
is uh, mu n equals some constant a times 1 minus alpha beta to the n. Again, we only have one term here because we only have an order 1 linear difference equations rather than the standard order 2 we were normally looking at before. Again, as always, we want to try a particular solution because we have an inhomogeneous equation. So we're going to try mu n equals constant because we have a constant beta on the right hand side here. So we're going to guess a constant uh, to try and get a particular solution. So if we substitute that in, what would we get? We'd get C minus 1 minus alpha plus beta C equals beta. Uh, that C and that 1 there cancel. The two minuses become a plus. So I believe we get C equals beta over alpha plus beta. So the general solution to the homogeneous equation is the sum of the solution to, sorry, to the inhomogeneous equation is the sum of the general solution to the homogeneous equation, which was that, and our particular solution, which was beta over alpha plus beta. We go back to the question, it then says, uh, using the initial condition mu naught equals lambda naught. So let's do that. Uh, we want lambda naught equals mu naught equals, uh, that first term will just give us an A, and that second term will give us a standard uh, beta over alpha plus beta, uh, which means that a is equal to beta over alpha plus beta uh, minus lambda naught. Okay. Uh, that's not right, is it? It's it, the plus and the minus are the other way around. Sorry, uh, this will give us a lambda naught minus beta over alpha plus beta. That's better. And so finally, the solution is uh, mu n equals a, which we now know is lambda naught minus beta over alpha plus beta, lots of 1 minus alpha plus beta to the n, plus our particular solution, beta over alpha plus beta. Is that what the question was asking for? Up we scroll, beta over alpha plus beta, lambda naught minus that same thing, times 1 minus alpha plus beta to the n. That is, we've got exactly what we want. Hurrah, so that answer is correct. Okay, let's keep moving on, part C. Part C says, what therefore are the limits as n to it tends to infinity? X n minus naught. So uh, x n minus naught is just mu n, so what's the limit of that? Well, let's look at this term here. As n tends to infinity, this first bit is just a constant. This second bit is something to the power of n. So it depends whether the something in absolute value is 1, less than 1, or bigger than 1. will depend on what happens. You've got 1 minus alpha plus beta. And we're told in the question that alpha and beta are both between 0 and 1 strictly. So alpha plus beta is between 0 and 2 strictly. So this is strictly between minus 1 and plus 1. So when this goes up to a power, it gets smaller. And so this thing here is, is tending to 0. So in fact, this whole first term tends to 0. And we'll just have beta over alpha plus beta from this term here being the only thing that survives. So that's the limit, uh, the limit as n tends to infinity, the property xn equals 0. And so the limit as n tends to infinity, of probability xn equals 1, has got to be 1 minus that, hasn't it? Because they've got to add up to 1. So that's just alpha over alpha plus beta. 
Finally, part D says, explain what happens if the Markov chain is started in the distribution lambda naught equals beta over alpha plus beta. So let's look back at this term again. If we start with lambda naught equals beta over alpha plus beta, then all that term is zero, isn't it? So all this disappears, and we just get mu n equals beta over alpha plus beta exactly for all n. And so uh, probability xn equals zero equals beta over alpha plus beta for all n, and probability xn equals one equals alpha over alpha plus beta for all n. So there's this kind of distribution that we're staying in. All right, we're staying in the same distribution. Later on in the course, we'll call a distribution that we stay in, stay in the same distribution. However, later on in the course, we'll call this a stationary distribution. So note this doesn't mean that we stay in the same state. It just means the probability we're in either of the states stay the same. You can think of this as if you started off with uh, a million like balls on your Markov chain, then the proportion of the balls on state zero would always be beta over plus alpha, alpha plus beta. The proportion of your balls in state one would always be alpha over alpha plus beta. But the balls would still be swapping. It's just that the total number in each would stay the same. So this probability that if you picked a ball at random, which state is it in, would stay the same. So we'll see that later on in, I think, uh, maybe lecture 10. And so let me also comment, previewing future work, that we had this limit and this limit here, which go to our stationary distribution. So we had this stationary distribution, but it was also the case that for any initial distribution, we tend towards the stationary distribution. And we'll also be looking at that later in the course in uh, lecture 11. We'll see that uh, we'll be looking at when do Markov chains have a stationary distribution like this one that we saw here and they'll be looking also at when is it the case that no matter where you start you get closer and closer to the stationary distribution. So that's a bit of a preview of things that will be coming up later in lectures 10 and 11. So it doesn't really matter if you don't understand them now but if you've understood the solution to this question 3 on problem sheet 3 then you're already part way to understanding some of the future work that will come up later in this course.